So let's talk about the wrist joint, which is a small joint, but it has a lot of connections and major uh, three connections within the joint. We have the carpal bones, we have ulna, and we have radius. All right. Uh, we talked about the distal radial nerve joint last time, where we said the radius is going to be your uh, concave and your ulna is going to be convex. But now let's see what happens in the wrist joint. We'll be talking about the arthrokinematics, concave and convex rule. All right, that's your first slide. Let's talk about the bones. And I think most of you remember the mnemonic of the carpal bones, how to remember the carpal bones. It goes by, she looks too pretty, try to catch her, right? She, scaphoid, lunate, looks. And then you have um, uh, triquetrum, which is two. She looks too pretty, try to catch her. Then you have trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and then you have um, uh, hamate and pisiform, okay? So we have she looks too pretty, try to catch her, okay? So this is a mnemonic that can help you to remember the carpal bones. Usually you don't have to remember the carpal bones for the exam. It's just that you need to know. For some, sometimes for the interventions, the question can come in the form of, okay, if you're using the ulnar side of the hand for a soft tissue massage or uh, mobilizing, which bone is mostly touching um, the, the patient's joint, then you can say, oh, pisiform is on the ulnar side. So I can, you know, and that's the most distal component in the, in the proximal row of the carpal bones, okay? But what I want you to show you to look at the, the surfaces of the articulating sur uh, of surfaces of the joints, okay? So this is going to be your wrist joint, okay? Here. Now we have concave surface, which is made by majorly the radius, and the convex surface is made by these pebbles looking bones, carpals, okay? Now this joint is convex moving on concave. If you can look at the camera, then I can show you how the movements goes, or maybe you can do it by yourself. If you wanna keep your hand in the mid prone position like this, and you flex and extend your wrist, you will see that the carpal bones are moving on the radius and the ulna. So we have convex moving on the concave. One more time. The bones here, the radius and the ulna are basically your concave surface, okay? And your carpals are going to be your convex surface. You see the protuberance in each carpal bone here? That is going to be moving in the open chain, All right? From the sideways, you can see lunate, which makes the connection with the radius. This is basically a chain that we're talking about, lunate, capitate, and third metacarpal. It basically makes one chain when you move your um, wrist into the flexion and extension, okay? So why we need to know about this chain? So anytime patient falls on the outstretched hand, the forces goes through the third metacarpal to capitate and then to lunate and then to the radius. This is how the forces goes when the patient falls onto the um, um, outstretched hand, all right? Now let's talk uh, more about, now this is the X-ray view of your wrist joint. You see how these carpal bones are moving on the radius. So if you look here, this is a radius articulating surface and this is ulnar articulating surface, right? The connection made by, made into the wrist joint is more of the radius styloid to the carpals. Okay, so this is basically a styloid process of the radius and this is the standard process of the ulna. So the radius articulating surface and the uh, carpal articulating surface makes the wrist joint. All right, now let's talk about how rolling and sliding happens. If you remember our previous discussion, rolling and sliding uh, are the physiological terms, but when you say rolling and gliding, they are going to be your mobilization terms, like if you want to mobilize it, if you want to provide a glide anterior or posteriorly, that's gonna be something when a patient, when a therapist performs passively. Uh, 
Okay, you know what, before we move on to the mobilization, I want to point out some things. If you're doing the ulnar and the radial deviation, okay? Now you see, you're able to do more ulnar deviation than the radial deviation. So radial deviation is usually about uh, maybe 15 degrees. And the ulnar deviation is usually 30 to 45 degrees. You know, it varies from person to person. So let's say 40 degrees of the ulnar deviation. Okay. Now you see it's the sideway movements, it's the deviation. Why do you think the radial deviation is lesser than the ulnar deviation? The answer to this question is the stylar process on the radius is much higher than the stylar process of the ulna. Okay. If the bone, the radius ends here, then the wrist would have. Um, equal deviations on both the sides. But because the radius stylar process is higher than the ulnar stylar process, that's why you have more ulnar deviation than the radial deviation because it gets blocked by the radial stylar process. All right, let me show you how much difference that it makes. When you talk about the stylar process of the radius, it's about 25 degrees angle. And when you talk about the ulnar stylar process, it's about 10 degrees angle from the straight line. Because the radius stylar is much higher than the ulnar stylar. That's why you, you, you are talking about almost 15 degrees more in the radial styloid angle. So that blocks your radial deviation. Okay. All right. Now, Let's say your patient has radial and ulnar deviation, okay? Now, what do you think? This space is all empty, okay? If a patient falls on the outstretched hand, what do you think a patient would have more injury on which side? Ulnar side or radial side? When a patient falls, when a patient complains of or shows up with a foosh injury, Okay, usually what we have heard and read that radial styloid fractures or you have scaphoid fractures, very common. Scaphoid makes direct connection with the radius. Okay, why do we have more fractures on the radial side than the ulnar side? Well, we know that the ulnar side is kind of empty over here due to the lower standard process. The reason is a structure called TFCC. Okay, TFCC means triangular fibrocartilage complex. This is basically a structure from where the major ligaments originates. And it's a thick uh, cartilage complex, which basically helps everyone to absorb the shock on the ulnar side of the wrist. So TFCC is a structure which helps to absorb the shock on the ulnar side, which helps us to prevent the fractures of the ulnar side. But there is no cushion on the radial side and the impact directly goes into the bones. That's why styler process of the radius and the scaphoid fractures are more common than the ulnar side. So make sure that you read about the TFCC. Maybe you can follow um, the book Dutton or maybe Physiopedia where you can find the concept of the TFCC. You can look into the, um, the components of the structures, but what's most important is the examination, like what movement needs to be done to make sure that the structure involvement is the TFCC, and what should be the restriction in the intervention, in the education part, what, what are you going to tell your patient to not to perform this specific movement? And, what kind of splint can be used for the TFCC patient? Okay, go ahead and search about it and then I will uh, give you the tips about uh, maybe later on of um, the examination, what movements will confirm the diagnosis, what education of um, the movements that you need to give to your patient, what's not to be done, and what kind of splint will help the patient to uh, speeden up the recovery for the TFCC um, um, injuries. All right. So, so far we have talked about the con convex and concave surface. We talked about why radial and ulnar deviation has their, those differences. And we talked about uh, what are the common injuries and what structures will be responsible for to prevent and to cause those injuries so far. Okay, let's talk about the convex moving on the concave. Uh, 
with flexion extension and radial and ulnar deviations um, of the wrist. All right, so I'm gonna show you this picture. Uh, probably, yeah, this is a, bit, a good picture for, for us to visualize the lateral view because when you're doing the flexion and extension, this is the best view that you can have to see or to use the goniometry if a patient is doing the complete flexion and, and complete extension. All right, now if you're looking at my hand laterally and I'm doing a flexion, you see my radius is fixed. Now I'm gonna talk more about the radius because radius is the bigger bone in the wrist. So most of the carpals are moving on the radius and ulna is slightly downward. So it doesn't have the direct connection with the carpals as such. So I'm gonna talk about the radial on the carpals or carpals on the radius, okay? When you're going into deflection, anatomically, according to the anatomical position, when I go towards my palmar side, it's called anteriorly. And when I go towards the dorsal side of my hand, it's gonna call posteriorly, okay? While doing the flexion, my hand is going towards anteriorly. And according to the concave, convex moving on concave, the rule is when the moving surface is convex, the glide is opposite to the movement, right? So if I want to improve it now, if you look at the distal component of the, of the hand, it's going anteriorly, which is why I'm talking about the carpals going posteriorly, all right? So if I say to improve the flexion at the wrist, let me just correct all the typos for you. To improve the flexion at the wrist, you can give the posterior glide to the patient and to improve the extension at the wrist, you can give anterior glide, okay? So to improve the flexion because the hand is going anteriorly, so you'll give posterior glide to the patient to improve the flexion because the convex is moving on the concave. So the glide is going to be opposite to the movement and the movement is anteriorly. So the posterior glide. And to improve the extension, you can give anterior glide because the hand is going posteriorly according to the anatomical position. And you can give the anterior glide to the patient to improve the extension. All right, now let's talk about the deviations, okay? We have the ulnar deviation and then we have radial deviation, right? For the ulnar deviation, you see now convex is moving on the concave. So the hand is going towards the ulnar side. I'm gonna give radial glide to improve the ulnar deviation. And when I do radial deviation, I'm gonna give ulnar glide, which means opposite to the direction of the movement. I'm gonna give ulnar glide to improve the radial deviation. All right, I hope it makes sense. So once again, I'm gonna say uh, uh, about deflection, extension and deviations. Because the convex is moving on concave, to improve the flexion, I will give the posterior glide. To improve the extension, I will give the anterior glide. To improve the ulnar deviation, I will give the radial glide. And to improve the radial deviation, I will give the ulnar glide on the basis of convex moving on the concave. That's it for the open chain extension and flexion. Now I'm gonna talk about the closed chain extension and flexion. All right, so we're gonna keep it here. So this is going to be our open chain. All right, now let's talk about the closed chain. All right, we have flexion and then we have extension. This is the only thing we're gonna talk about closed chain. We're not gonna talk about the ulnar and um, uh, radial deviation because there are not a lot of ADLs, but I'll give you the tips. Maybe you'll be able to relate with them. Now think about if you're sitting on a table, okay? You went to the restaurant, okay? You're sitting on the table. You, know, you wanna get up from the table, okay? So let's say this is your, your table and this is how your hands are placed here, okay? When you try to stand up from the table, you place your hand and this is how your hand goes. Maybe you wanna try it to, to understand it better, okay? Place your hands in front of you on a table and try to stand up. When you try to stand up, okay, this is how you do. Now I'm gonna pull my hand like this. This is what I, the movement that I got when I was standing up. That means I perform extension at the wrist when I'm standing up. When I'm placing my hands 
on the table and I'm standing up, extension is something that I got on my wrist joint. Now in the open chain, we know to improve the extension, I would give anterior glide. But in closed chain, things are different because your carpals are fixed. The bone that moved is your radius, right? Now the carpals are fixed, okay? I'm sorry for the typos, there you go. And the carpals are fixed and the carpals are convex and the radius is concave, all right? When the carpals are fixed and you performed extension, your radius moved on the carpals, which means your concave moved on the convex, all right? In closed chain, if you want to improve the extension, then you will give posterior glide on radius over carpals because carpals are fixed on the table. You cannot glide the carpals anymore. The glide, the bone that you're going to glide is your radius. So in order to improve this moment, you're gonna grab the radius and pull it posteriorly to improve the extension at the wrist joint. And for the flexion, you're going to give anterior glide because concave moved on the convex. Let me give you a better clarity on that particular subject. Now, just look at my hand for a minute. When I do flexion, this is how it goes. Look at the end result. My palm is getting closer to my, is getting towards my anterior aspect of the forearm, right? Now, this is open chain flexion. What is closed chain flexion? Closed chain flexion is, if this is extended position, I'm gonna move my radius like this. This is closed chain flexion. And if I look at the end result, this is exactly the same what I did in the open chain. The movement, the end result remains the same. What differs is what uh, bone is moving. In the orthokinematics, in the whole joint, is it convex moving on concave or concave moving on concave? So when I'm doing the anterior, when I'm doing deflection in the closed chain, you see my carpals didn't move. It still moved towards the anterior aspect. So I'm gonna give anterior glide. When the concave surface moves on the convex, you give the glide in the same direction. So if my radius moved into the anteriorly, I'm gonna give anterior glide to improve the flexion in the closed chain of the wrist joint. And when I'm doing the extension, not by not moving the wrist, uh, by not moving the carpals, it, the posterior forearm is going the closer to the dorsal aspect of the hand, which means the posterior direction. So I'm gonna give posterior glide to improve the extension on the carpals, uh, on the radius over the carpals, all right? So this is how you differentiate between open chain wrist flexion extension and closed chain wrist flexion and extension. I hope it makes sense.